Hi, I am Preeti, and it is my pleasure to meet you here at DotScale. And today we're going to be talking about data cartography. And it sounds very complicated, or not so much, but it's important, if not the most important part of your application or the solution that you're trying to build. Data is somewhat, mostly, does anybody agree, disagree, the key element of the solutions that we build. And so, with the advancements in technology, like cloud computing, the data stores that you could use, and even the data visualizations and the tools available to do that, um, it's become increasingly difficult to choose which you know, elements, or it's almost like a slot machine. What do I choose? What should be the data store? What should be the visualization language? How do I actually build a solution? And so with this presentation, hopefully, we'd be able to figure out a four-step model to pick the right data store for our solutions that probably, hopefully, stand the test of time, give us efficiency, performance, and all the things that we care about. So diving right in, data is dynamic because human activities are dynamic. And just to tell you how dynamic human activities are, Here's how I got here. So, yes, uh, I started with New York, went to a bunch of places, and I've managed to look like an NP complete metric or delta traveling salesman problem. And yes, we optimize for a certain metric that looks weird, but you get two takeaways from this. A, that you're not going to be choosing me to basically plan your next trip, which is completely fine. Um, and two, if you look close enough, uh, this is the hub-and-spoke model. The hub-and-spoke model is, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a common paradigm or uh, topography optimization model that is used uh, in the aviation industry uh, for planning routes, where the hubs are the cities or the airports, uh, and the spokes are the routes between those cities. So when air, where airlines are planning a new route or planning even the routes that exist, uh, this is the model that they use. And if Paris being a hub, all of us being here, if all of us decided to go to some someplace else after the conference, and aviation is not the only place where the hub and spoke model is used. But when a patient has a heart failure, they're basically coming from the tertiary hub, which has the most resources, the most specialized care available, uh, going to the primary hub, and then finally to their local or personal health care providers. If you look at the image here, it's also used in content marketing. So in content marketing, the goal is to get your content out to as many people as possible, as many viewers as possible, um, and so the hubs would be the different ways you could get this content out, like Twitter, Facebook, emails, phone calls, however you decide to do it. Um, and the spokes would be the flow of the users from each of these um, places where they could access the content. So now we have identified that the hub and spoke model, being a data model, is dynamic because human events are dynamic. So in each of the three examples that we saw before in different industries, there were the hub and spoke model being our data model. We saw that we were trying to map human events where people were doing certain actions, uh, be it uh, trying to access social media or connect with the world or to travel across the world. Um, events are dynamic, and so data models are dynamic. But what is a data model? A data model is just an abstraction of your data, such that once you've defined your data model, uh, you'd be able to fit in all new data coming into your system into that data model. Looking at this example from uh, GitHub, it's an open source project called openflights.org. Uh, you have all the data available, and uh, it, gives, it gives you data about all the hubs and spokes uh, that are available uh, for, for certain airlines. And let's talk about um, how we can start storing this data. 
and how we define this data model. So if you look at this, the first thing that comes to our mind is it's, it's row-based data. We could easily use a relational data model for this. Um, why do we have to go beyond the relational databases that we already use? But like I said before, with advancements in technology, cloud computing, even your data stores, now you have a key value store, a column family store, a document store, and even graph databases to choose from. And so which data store do you use? Because as we saw before, this problem can be easily solved with a relational database as well. So the most important question, what DB do we choose? And this suddenly escalated. If you look at what's happening here in this visualization, it's still the hub and spoke model. It's still the same relational data that we saw before. But now what we are trying to measure is which cities are central. And we're trying to rank them. It's a metric that we're calculating based on the number of spokes that a city falls on. So if you look at this, and if this is the problem that we're trying to solve, um, we care about the hubs. We also care about the spokes. We also want to do leveled analysis on this. So does Paris fall on the first path or the second hop? And doing this with a relational database will ultimately reduce the performance of the system that you're trying to build. The computations that you need to carry out at runtime would also reduce your performance, and thus performance optimization will be a huge area of effort um, as you try to solve this problem using a relational data store with the data that you had. Let's, let's think about it and do this exercise. Can we use a graph database? Maybe we can. There's a node, which is our hub. There are some edges, which is our spokes. Um, we can easily represent all the data that we have um, in this data model, possibly. And it contrasts from a relational database because it's designed to be graph first. It's designed for this data model. And so essentially, if I try to do joins on this, it wouldn't be such a computationally heavy or expensive operation because it's designed that way. It achieves joins at a logical level. So maybe, maybe this will work. And here's an example of how this might look. And this is um, an example of all the packages available for the Debian project. And the green dots are the contributors and the different packages that those contributors contributed. What becomes very uh, easy to identify here is that like the packages, every contributor has contributed to many different packages. Pairs will have flights to many different places. And so you're not storing the data twice or over and over again, uh, which ultimately then again adds to your performance and enables you to scale really fast as well. And the implementation of the graph database relies heavily on those edges as well. And there are two types of graph databases, native and non-native graph databases. Native graph databases are designed with graph-first approaches where this is done at a logical level, whereas you can create your own graph database um, from any other normal relational database as well using indices, and that would be an example of a non-native graph database. But it might not give you the same performance that a graph-first database gives you. With time, we've also wanted to do distributed graph processing. And this is enabled by having partitions of edges and vertices on different stores. Um, and you're able to easily go through all of them with a better performance than an individual one as your data grows um, because of how it's partitioned, how the graph is implemented, how the ind indexing is done, and how it's, it's a graph database is essentially a graph-based database, and graphs are based on the routing pro protocols that we've studied before, basically just um, pointers of edges and nodes. For all those familiar with Spark, um, it allows you to do the analysis like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science with a better performance um, in a clustered or a distributed environment than the native, native Spark row-based implementation as well, if your data model is the correct one. 
So data models are dynamic, and data applications are dynamic. Because we would like to do something with the data, and knowing what we'd like to do quickly changed our choice from a relational database to a graph database. Uh, if we were not going to calculate the betweenness metric, if we were not going to see uh, which city was central to a lot of spokes or hubs, um, we wouldn't have to go the route of graph databases. And so today, uh, if we decided, again, to go to a place from this conference, all of us, um, we would have to do something completely different. And let's see if a graph database would help us there. So all of us want to decide to go somewhere together after this conference. Maybe it could be, um, I don't know, Nice, London, wherever you want to go. And so our problem quickly changes from measuring the betweenness of a city to getting consensus in this room. And that's a completely different problem. And graph databases will no longer work the same way um, a database that is designed for consensus would. And this quickly will become this problem, which is basically all of us want to go to one place. All of us want to decide where we're trying to go. Um, we want to get all of us to agree to go to the same place, making sure that any place that we have decided is mutually agreed upon and there is no fault which means that all of us reach the same place. Um, and this is uh, commonly described as the Byzantine or Byzantine generals problem, um, and it's used in system design as well to make sure that if there's uh, a multi-tainted system, if one of the nodes fails, we, the system is able to tolerate the fault of that node, identify it, um, and move from there, fail gracefully. And a database or a data model that solves this consensus problem very effectively is the hash graph. It basically uses uh, the gossip protocol. So basically, if all of us in this room started talking to the two people next to us and started asking where would you like to go given 10 options or 15 options of flights that fly from Paris, um, we would soon start talking amongst each other and to be able to reach consensus, uh, a hash graph would basically propagate all the information, would basically work something like, I told both my neighbors my first choice, my neighbors told both their neighbors their first choice and my first choice, and so on. Which city got the most votes? Because we would be propagating all the information that we know, um, as well as the information that was given to us by our neighbors. And that's, that's how this works, and this might be a good solution. But then we would have to buy the tickets, right? Because we actually do want to go. So at that point, you start thinking about maybe we could use a blockchain. It also gets you to consensus, and it also allows you to, to share money, give money, and actually buy those tickets. And so now, we have moved even from application to operation. We understood that our application was dynamic, but everything changes as soon as we start thinking about the protocols or the operation that we're actually trying to do with the data. So data models are dynamic, data applications are dynamic, and data operations are dynamic. If everything is dynamic, what is the static? How do we actually choose that data model? And instead of thinking about it from a bottom-up approach, we have to think of it top-down. We have to think about the operation that we're trying to perform first, then the application, then the data model, and then finally the data store. The biggest problem that data science has introduced or AI has introduced is the blindness to big picture bias. For those of you who are not familiar with this, this basically speaks of and something that crops up in application design as well is working in a silo and not thinking about the big picture problem that you're trying to solve, which is the operation piece of this bubble. Once you know your true north and how it adjusts, 
uh, you'd be able to pick the application. So my true north is to go to agree to go somewhere after this. And so knowing that, the application would be, how do we get there? How do we make sure that everybody knows everybody has uh, the opportunity to pick a place of their choice to buy those tickets and actually get there? The data model uh, would reflect all the data entities, like the actors in the system, as well as all the things that are relevant to us. And knowing all of this, when we choose the data store, uh, we'd be certain that A, it would, based on our true north, it would stand the test of time, give us some efficiency. Since it's designed specifically for the problem that we're trying to solve, it would give us better performance for that use case. Um, and it would give us flexibility and agility in terms of switching from our true north because we would know exactly where we are trying to go at every step instead of picking the relational database to begin with, and then going, you know, trying to fix it, and then going from V1 to V2 and getting stuck there. Um, and hopefully, this will help you reduce some, reduce some rework, bring some efficiencies into your you know, design paradigms, into your system design. Um, and, and I hope that it, it brings you as many efficiencies that it brought us. Thank you.